Yes, well, thank you very much for the invite. Um, it's, it's been a fantastic opportunity. I've always wanted to come to California. So if you combine work and pleasure, even better. So yes, we were talking in uh, Tokyo about the uh, big data analytics that you guys do. And um, over the last sort of five or six years, um, I've actually been working on an area that sort of involves big data. Not necessarily the analysis of the big data, but more, uh, more importantly, oh, sorry, more importantly, um, sort of how you create big data, another application of big data. Um, I've just been speaking to um, some of you in the audience. I mean, there's obviously all the um, sort of the uh, the uh, medical side of big data. You've obviously got the geographical sides of big data. But what I want to do is look at the entertainment side of big data. And I've given this title, um, Metadata, Creating a Molehill Out of a Mountain. Because this is something that we're trying desperately within the media sector to deal with. Um, what I want to do first is just briefly go over a little bit of the history of multimedia. Um, starts in about 1873, Nick Caldisk. Then we start looking at, so we're talking now, what, 100, 130, 140 years ago. You're talking the very first film recorded, 1978, sorry, 1878. Um, first talking cinema, the jazz player, 1927. So you can see we've got this very colourful history of multimedia. Uh, first regular UK television broadcast system, uh, the man with a flower in his mouth. Uh, never been able to get a hold of a copy of it, so I couldn't tell you what it's all about. Kind of might be, the title might be quite indicative. Um, so you can see we've been going on, and over the last sort of 20 years, 1997 onwards, there's been a huge explosion in the media sector. Um, where I want to look at this um, presentation is in two sectors. The professional, and then let's start looking into the consumer. What I mean by the consumer is anybody who can walk in to Sears, into Radio Shack, pick a device off the shelf, that's consumer. So, say in the early 80s, it would cost maybe $750,000 if you were lucky to build a television production studio. Okay? Now, you can turn around off the shelf components and build a reasonable studio in your garage for, what, $20,000, $15,000? The majority of that is the cost of the camera. We're talking a thousand pounds for a computer, sorry, thousand dollars for a computer, we're talking control. Maybe a couple of thousand dollars for the software. But other than that, you can basically turn around and build yourself a production studio in your garage. And a lot of people are doing this. Now this is a Google map, as you can see. And what the little dots are in here are simple search of media production companies in the United States. And there are over 20,000 registered production companies in the United States. Whereas, maybe 20 years ago, you might have found, say, a thousand or so. So over the last 20 years, there's been this huge boom in the, in the numbers of media production companies. In Europe, the same sort of growth has occurred. You might have turned around and seen maybe three or four hundred in the UK alone. Now there's over 10,000 media production companies. So what does this mean? Well, we're creating vast amounts of media, okay? huge amounts, and ideally the media production companies want to have very nicely catalogued, very easily searchable content libraries, nicely stacked, all catalogued, number numbered, and so it's easy to turn around and grab a specific part at a specific time. But in reality, we end up with this. The organisations are so fast paced, you're moving from one project to another to another, it's so fast, the organisation of your material is just seen to be a, a, just a secondary thought. Well, we'll do that when, when, when we've got some time. I spoke to a company um, about two or three years ago, and I was talking to them about me, um, metadata production. And um, their CEO turned around to their, one of their uh, main sort of archivists and said, oh, well, we don't need to worry about, about organising our media, do we? We've got it all nicely catalogued. 
And their production guy just turned around and said, you're joking, aren't you? And he opened up a cupboard, and that was pretty much what you saw. At most, they're put on a shelf. And this is a good case. In reality, we've got this. I mean, I've got here, eight track tapes, slides, cassettes, VHS, Betamax, film, um, photographs, cassettes, you name it. There are thousands of different types of format available. So, we've got a problem, especially if you've got a company that's been going for several hundreds of, well, say several hundreds of years, several decades. You're going to mount vast quantities of this material. Should you, therefore, keep the equipment necessary to be able to re-access this material? Well, the proper answer is, of course you should. So, you need to keep 8-track players, you need to keep slide projectors, you'll need to keep all these, all these basic pieces of equipment. But is it realistic? Well, of course it's not. Um, we went to the uh, BBC, uh, about a year or so ago, we're speaking to them about the various different archive formats they've got. And they said, well, they have a guy, his sole job is maintaining obsolete equipment. Because you cannot now just go into the shop and buy an 8-track player, unless you go into specialised retro shops. Which I noticed there are a couple actually down, chat, uh, down, the, um, down the main high street in Orange. Very interesting. So, how are we going to deal with this problem? Because this is a problem. What we've got is film, for example. Film's great. Film is of really good quality. But leave it too long, you end up with this. Okay? What we have here is uh, cellulose triacetate. Film is made of cellulose triacetate. Cellulose uh, triacetate plus water gives you vinegar, ethanoic acid. And this is exactly what this is called. It's called vinegary. And once we get to this situation, well, it no longer becomes an archive problem, it becomes restoration. And the worst case scenario is we end up with this totally You can't restore this, it's dust. So this is asset that's gone. This is history erased. National Film Archive in Mexico, okay, 1982. Um, five people died. 99% of their archive was destroyed. Why? Film explosion. Nitrate-based films, I'm sure you're all aware, after a while, become just dangerously, spontaneously combustible. This is the effect. Tragic loss of life, okay? Equally tragic loss of history. All the material, gone. Six, five or 6,000 items, gone. A whole area of history gone. But you think, oh, modern, modern devices, yeah, they'll be okay. This is tape, 25 years old. Um, VHS, Betamax. This is the sort of thing we're now getting when we actually start readdressing, re putting. Um, I mean, I don't know how many of you actually have a tape player anymore. VHS or Betamax tape player anymore. I gave mine away years ago. Okay? Have all this tape, cannot access. Same problem. So, what's the solution? I'll tell you what, we'll repurpose it. The problem with repurpose is, well, for those who may not be familiar, repurposing is moving from one format to another. Okay? The problem with repurpose is it's expensive and it's time consuming. But the other problem is, if I repurpose, what format do I repurpose to? Do I convert it into H.264? Do I convert it into um, MPEG-2? What format am I going to convert it? How am I going to store it? Am I going to store it on hard drives, flash drives, solid state devices? These are all questions you need to answer. And you need to be looking into the future. Because every time you look at repurposing this stuff, you're going to lose quality, unless you can get back to access 
to the, pre the original material. But then you haven't solved that problem. So, I mean, here's a few statistics. But the fact of the matter is, repurposing is a darn, is a darn sight cheaper than restoration. Um, on UC, um, but, um, UCLA, actually, Film Archive, they were doing some projects, and it costs, for a black and white film, somewhere between thirty dollars to $40,000 to restore one item. For colour, you're looking at $100,000 to $150,000, because you have to restore each and every frame. There's a huge project going on at the moment to try to get back the Buster Keaton archives. All of this is now this chemical mush. And he made thousands of films, a lot of it hasn't ever been seen, simply because it's now this chemical mush. But there is a problem. Yes, we can repurpose, 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 but MVC exists for one reason, money. It's not there to better mankind as much as they might want to. They have shareholders. So we're now talking about repurposing material. Their big question is, do we have to? Just said, this costs serious money. The BBC archives in the UK has over 3 million items of archive. How can we basically turn this into a money-making exercise? How can we reduce the costs? Okay? So I have to ask you, what is the purpose of television programming? Making scrubs or friends or whatever it is you want to watch. It's an interesting way of putting it. Television programs are there to fill the gaps in between the adverts. You make money from adverts. The actual programming costs money. There's various different ways you can produce revenues. You've got entertainment, you've got factual information, um, you've got events, corporate, training. These are all ways of, that a company can generate these sorts of money. And a recent, uh, this is actually quite old now, it's about a year old, this analysis. Um, there was a, um, what this is trying to show you is the amount of increase in, um, in budgets that people are putting into marketing. And you can see there's quite a lot of um, websites, social media, you've got telemarketing, direct mail. These are sort of slowly dropping. But you've got television and web and all this sort of thing. They're increasing budgets. So there's a huge drive. But the problem is, while the amounts are going up, the amounts going into marketing are going up, so are the number of these production companies. So the market share is being diluted. It's a huge amount of dilution. So we've got a supply and demand problem. We've got too many media production companies, not enough marketing, not enough, not enough customers. So you drive prices down to get the competition. Now, unfortunately, it's the small companies who have the better competition because they have lower costs. Okay, does that then decrease in quality? <clears throat> Sometimes. Most of the time, let's be honest. Are you going to get the Hollywood style production that you might see from marketing? So, what's the answer? What the big companies are now looking at is video resale. Focal International, video resale made £250 million last year. And this is growing. And you think, video resale, why would I want to buy a clip from the 1950s, 1940s? Simple. If the film has already been recorded, how can you go, why should you worry about going out and re-recording this? So, for example, um, there's footage you're never going to get again. Okay, the, um, I mean, take for example, good ones, the Kennedy assassination clips. Okay, you can't go back and refilm that. Okay, Churchill stuff, you cannot go back and refilm this. Okay, but there's also a massive drive for modern, um, new resale, clip resale. So, for example, you send a team off to Antarctica to go and film polar bears. 
you're looking for something with polar bears. Now, for every hour of footage, it, they might actually capture 10 hours or 100 hours of useless footage. But who says this material is useless? Okay? I might, in that 100 hours of me trying to shoot the polar bears, I might catch well, seals, whales. Now, that's not of interest to my current um, program, but it may be to polar bears too, this time we've got whales. Okay? So, how can we actually um, monetize that? How can we get some form of asset? Do we send these guys back out to now go, right, now take 100 hours to get polar bears and whales? Well, it's simple. You turn around to someone and say, well, have we already got that? Didn't we do that last year? So, somehow, we've got to turn this into what we would like. This is what we have, this is what we would like. So we can turn into that. <laughs> and the answer is metadata. Now, what is metadata? Metadata is defined as data about data. Now, that could be a bit confusing, so very simply turning around and saying, right, okay, I've got all this huge amounts of information. Okay, video, audio, okay? Scene information, captions, digital rights, format information. How can I collect this in such a way that it's searchable and retrievable? The answer is metadata, okay? The problem we're going to get in here is how do you deal with that metadata? Because we've got phenomenal amounts of the stuff. Okay, just a simple, um, a simple piece of speech. The average Eng um, English speaker speaks at somewhere between um, 200, about well, 150 and 200 words a minute. I'm probably closer to 300 words a minute. So for every minute of, of footage, you're going to get. 200 words coming out. All this is metadata. Is it all important? <laughs> the, co the company I work for, um, as well as the Moffat University, I also um, work for a company called MediaTag. And what we've been doing is we've been trying to look at how can we extract metadata. And about halfway into the project, we made a very uh, important mistake. I'm um, not proud of it, but it serves as a useful example of why you have to be so careful. We thought, right, okay, we'll use a very simplistic mining approach with speech. We'll do speech recognition, okay? We'll use some ways of improving the speech recognition, and then what we'll do is we'll just pass it, simply pass it through a reject dictionary, and we'll get rid of all the pronouns, all the, um, some of the adjectives, Okay, anything that we think isn't important. Unfortunately, there's one word that slipped in there. And you'll understand when I say what this word, what the horrific ramifications were. And the word is not. <laughs> this is not acceptable becomes this is acceptable. Mass murder is not acceptable. Suddenly you're saying mass murder is acceptable. <laughs> I don't think we could really go and say that. So, who makes the decision? So, this is where analytics comes in. How do you mine all these huge amounts of data? Well, that's, that's, that's a $10 million question, isn't it? And this is, this is why analytics is actually so important with the metadata. This is a big data problem. Because what we want to do is we want to turn this into a simple Google search. Type in keywords, I want to find clips of Adolf Hitler. Boom, there you go. None of this searching through media like you do at the moment, going to the library. Have you got any clips of Adolf Hitler? Oh, I don't know, this archive might do over in London. Right, have you got, I want to go on to a generic Google site, type in clips, it will search all the way around the world. So I then turn around to, um, British Pathway and say, right, I see you've got this clip, I'd like, to, I'd like to buy that piece of footage. Because I'm doing a documentary on World War II, for example. 
So, in 2002, um, there was a study done, and they estimated that there was approximately 200 million hours worth of archive globally. Now, a recent, more recent study has said this is growing exponential, and an exponential growth. And they reckon there's going to be oh, countless amounts of hours by 2015. So, just to put in perspective of why this might be, can I just have a bit of audience participation now? Can I show a hand here? Who does not own a camera? You don't own a camera of any type. Have you got a cell phone with a camera? I think every single person on this planet now, that to, maybe a bit of an over-exaggeration, I would say something like, you're the very first person that's actually said no to that one, actually. I would say the majority of people on this planet have access to a camera. And this isn't me, by the way, this isn't me being impolite and playing with my phone, this is my control. Okay, but there's a camera. I have a camera down here. You all have cameras. So, think about 20 years ago. Okay? Um, I appreciate some of you here may not be able to, but some of my colleagues here may. 20 years ago, you go on holiday, you take your camera, you take a couple of rolls of film. Okay? Maybe 48 photographs. You go click, 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 click. When those 48 photographs are gone, that's it. You don't take any more. Either that or you go and buy some more film. You get home, you get them developed, you go through them, well that didn't turn out, that goes in the bin. Okay? Put them into a photo album, and there you go. You've taken your snaps, you've taken the good ones, you sorted them out, you put them in a photo album, put them in the drawer. Okay? Now, let's jump forward to 2002. The reason why I choose this one is this is when this phenomenon hit me. 2002, I got my first uh, digital camera. The reason I know it's 2002 is a wedding present. Okay? So I dare to forget that. <laughs> so, I had a digital camera, we went on our honeymoon, and uh, it was literally click, 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 click. Anything that moved had a photograph of it. By the end of that holiday, two week holiday, had over a thousand photographs. So, you can all empathise, yeah? You just click, 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 click. Fire and forget albums. So, I got home, downloaded them onto my computer, went through each photograph, labelling them all up, where I was, who's in the photograph, the points of interest, um, trying to give dates, locations, all this metadata. Of course I didn't. Who does? At most, you're going to turn around, Download them onto your computer, maybe put them in a folder called My Vacation. Okay? That's as much as people have time to do. Okay? We've got all these different sources. We've now got cameras. We've got. All, it just goes on and on. Over the time, we're collecting all these different formats of content. So, how do we deal with this? Okay. We can repurpose, but to what format? Okay? I mean, come on, if we don't have time to sort this stuff out, we certainly don't have access to the budgets required to move your Super 8 video you recorded in the 1970s onto DVD. Okay? If the, if the industry doesn't have this, then we certainly are not going to have to. Because the other problem is, while the industry is being paid to be thinking about the future, what about us? Okay? A little while ago, I underwent a uh, program to take all my DVDs and put them onto a NAS server. And I thought, great, yeah, no problem. This was two years ago. And the big codec at the time, XFID. Did it all as XFID. Now, high definition, H.264, they're rubbish. The quality is awful. Now I've got to start again. This took me weeks to do this, months of my computer going continuously. I simply don't have the time to continuously repurpose my material. But with these sorts of stuff, should I be forced to rebuy it? Well, that's an open to an interesting, an interesting debate. But this is just one source. So we've got videos, we've got cameras, we've got music, we've got 
all these variety of different forms of input, each can store information about our daily lives. Okay? We're going to basically create huge amounts that are going to swamp the market, the professional space. We're already created more in the social networking space, the personal space. We've created much more than the professional all put together. Look at YouTube. YouTube has over 6,000 videos uploaded a minute. Okay? Facebook is becoming one of the areas of sharing um, videos, of sharing photographs. I mean, how many people don't upload photographs to Facebook? There, I would imagine there might be a few here, but the majority now, it's just second nature. You share your life with the world. There's a couple of projects going on at the moment that are taking this to the next level. It's called the Life Log. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. The Life Log is simple. It's one of these, much smaller, that hangs around your neck and records your life. You'll be walking around, turning around and meeting people. And then imagine if you had, um, you turn around and meet someone, you go, I know who you are, who are you? And then a little prompt turns around and says, oh yeah, that's, that's Bob Jones. Oh, that's where I know that person from. Hi Bob, how are you doing? It'll get you out of a lot of these very embarrassing situations. Okay? So, what do we mean by metadata in the consumer space? So, what I've put up here is a very, very simple picture. Okay? Straightforward picture. So what is the description of this? Well, I've put down a few interesting terms. Picture of a beach, picture of an umbrella, picture of the sea, maybe some blue, blue skies and clouds. But then we're looking at the more contextual holiday. Beautiful, peaceful. Can we spot the problem with those particular keywords? Vacations in this film. Absolutely. <laughs> and that was done on purpose. Imagine you're searching for vacation. That, that photograph is lost. It will not come up in a search unless you're using something, something slightly more intelligent. Okay? Imagine, though, you turn around, I mean, something like, <laughs> obviously with something quite extreme like that, is the um, spelling correction will come in, kick in. Did you mean? and so on, as you get in Google. But um, imagine you've got very common, a misspelling of very common words. Okay, um, I'm just trying to think, uh, just trying to think of, uh, uh, I had an example in October, but we've forgotten. There are, there are many words, uh, forget it. You need the thing around your neck. That's it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But you can see where you're going from, small misspellings. You cannot just turn round and say, oh yeah, don't you mean such and such. I mean, how many of you have ever seen uh, autocorrect on the Apple? And you write in things, it autocorrects to something you so didn't intend. That's what I'm talking about. You can't necessarily autocorrect. Okay? We've all seen damnthatautocorrect.com. Very funny. But very true. Okay, so I mean, this is a relatively straightforward scene. What happens, though, if we happen to have something like this? This is slightly more involved. Who is the focus? What is the focus of this picture? Is it this beautiful lady in the front? Is it Elvis? Is it the crowd? Is the photographer trying to capture the essence of the crowd? Is the person a fetishist who has this thing for elevators? <laughs> Escalators, what have you? Is this just a vacation shot of Las Vegas? Well, yes, because I happen to take a picture. And I know that it happens to be Las Vegas. But there's nothing really, that, apart from an Elvis impersonator, that would give you that sort of indication. So, how would we analyse this? How would we extract good, useful information from this? Well, the simple answer is you extract everything. And I hand this over to you guys. 
for the analytics. Mine this. Get the useful stuff out of this. Okay? Because the problem you have with metadata, too much information is, on, is sometimes just as bad as not enough. Um, one of the very first drawbacks we came with in the company, the project we were working with, was we gave all the metadata, everything we extracted to clients, and they just turned around on a third, on a sudden like a 30 minute clip, we gave vast amounts of metadata, that metadata, we said, there you go, there's all your metadata for this clip. And they just looked at this and went, this will just saturate our search engine. How do we mine the useful information? What is useful information? So, things to think about. We've got this issue that we've got a, um, we've got this media that needs to be continuously being repurposed. Okay? Um, we've got to have this migration strategy. How can I change my H264 to H265? Am I going to think that? Okay? I need to be able to keep this history of changes. This is all part of the metadata that we need to keep in. But I need to keep this intact. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I turn around and create a piece of footage, and I go and ship it off to my parents, for example, the metadata needs to follow that. Otherwise, she'll put it into her archive, and then it'll get lost if the metadata doesn't follow it. Okay? And more importantly, we need to make sure that rights are maintained. Okay? And the goal, the goal we're looking for is, can we keep this stuff for 100 years without it getting lost? Well, that's the target. How does interest, industry do this? Simple, they don't. They ignore it. La 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 la. Want to move to 3D? Ah! No. We'll stick with standard, oh, standard definitely. Oh no, we'll stick to NTSC, thank you. No, no, no. The customers want um, digital TV. Oh, do we have to? Then begrudgingly, they'll move. Oh no, now the next thing's high definition. What a what? We've only just moved over to standard definition. There's a very slow reaction speed in the media industry. Why? Because we've always done it like this. And it takes revolutionaries to say, do you know what? I'm going to give this a go. Peter Jackson in the latest Hobbit film, high frame rate. Had some interesting ramifications, but at least he took the plunge and said, let's try something new. A lot of people won. Why? Because the money that's riding on it. Get it wrong, and that's your career gone. I suppose someone like Peter Jackson can afford to take that risk. He's got the reputation behind him. But not everyone will. But can the, can the consumer afford to do this? It's estimated by 2014 that you and I will have, on average, 250 gigabytes of personal content. This is not including all the terabytes and terabytes of, um, of um, professional content you might download. On, through whatever me mechanism. But I mean, you take high definition cameras. Um, I'm recording this presentation now, and I suspect this, this presentation will probably take up three or four, five, six gigabytes. Okay? So when this, when this number came out, I actually think that's actually rather conservative. But they think globally, by 2015, you're going to be in exabytes, exabytes of personal content globally. Can we deal with that? Well, why should you? Why should we? Why should you keep everything? Interesting. Why would you not want to? Because if you throw things away, part of your life is gone. Well, life is gone anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. There's a reason to keep everything. Sometimes there is. But how do you know whether you're going to throw it away or whether to keep it? What could have value? 10 years down the line may not have value now. And this is the problem they're facing within the personal space. How do you determine what has value? I mean, just take a good example is, um, I'm trying to think of an applicable example over here in the US. There was a, there was a there was, in the UK, there was um, Big Brother, okay? Um, there was a, a person who didn't win Big Brother, 
but she did a very, very good job. Her name was Jane Goody. And um, she's one of these people, one of these celebrities that's famous for no reason. Just is famous. Uh, and really, I don't know, she's famous for being really annoying. I think that was what the issue was. You may have heard of her, I mean, she was trying to get into acting and she's mad, nah, didn't work. Anyway, she, um, she did every opportunity she got was to get publicity, publicity, publicity. And um, she was very good at that. So again, she was famous for no reason other than she was very good at publicity. She died from uh, breast cancer um, about three years ago. All this stuff that she'd done suddenly had value. And they repurposed it, resold it, and they made quite a lot of money. You imagine when Bill Gates dies, how much his footage will be worth. Now that's something you could predict. But you imagine this piece of footage I'm, I'm, I'm recording now of me speaking. Now, in 10 years, 15 years time, I could be the next Bill Gates. I just don't know that. <laughs> It'd be nice. Hopefully not that sadistic, but hey. But you just don't know what this footage is worth. So, be on the safe side, let's keep it, because it might be worth something someday. Now, there are issues. I create my content as a consumer. Who owns that content? I, I notice people shaking their heads going, God, we all know about this, hopefully. Instagram. You upload your photos to Instagram, they can sell it. Do they have the right to do that? I don't know, I've only even heard from the media space. No. Well, in the media space, in the professional space, the rights management is very, very clear. The creator of the content owns the content. The photographer that comes to, um, to, to photograph your wedding owns the rights to those photos. And when you hire that person, even though I'm paying that person maybe two, three, four, five hundred dollars to come and do a job, they still own the rights to that media. They give me an exclusive license to use it anywhere I want, but they still own the rights. But does Instagram have the right to up monetize its content? Well, this is so, so flaky. And if they decide to be a little bit more honest, I know, I know they've withdrawn this now, but if they decide to be a little bit more honest about this, how would they manage these rights? How can they maintain of who this IP belongs to? Well, this is where the metadata comes in. That's why the metadata must always remain with the content. That's why it's so important that it remains with it. Okay? Now, we're in a global world, run by different laws, different infrastructures. Whose law do we agree? Do we agree to the law as